on him. Wow. He stayed calm, like remarkably calm through the whole thing. Paxton took it in stride saying, I guess he knew I was Canadian. <laughs> How unbelievable Properly is that, Properly and right? well said. I'll also be hosting uh, In for Laura tonight on the Ingram Angle and watch Fox and Friends Weekend all weekend yes. long. All right. Yes. Yes. In. You go, Pete. Gotcha. Okay, Lisa. It's Autism Awareness Month. Uh, my little brother has Asperger's, so this is near and dear to my heart. I just wanted to, there's a, a TSA posted a mom's uh, Facebook post to them. And basically, this employee just made the process very seamless for her. Anyone who knows anyone on the spectrum, even just things as simple as going through a security line can be very, very difficult uh, with that sort of anxiety that it brings. So just take some time this month to have a little empathy for someone who may be a little different. Absolutely. Terrific. God bless. I'm on the board of Culture City for Autism Awareness. Oh, that's awesome. your DVIs. Never miss an episode of The Five. Have a great weekend. Special report up next. Hey, Brad. Hey, Kimberly. Thanks. President Trump slaps new sanctions on Russian oligarchs over election meddling and other activity. China vows to fight the U.S. at any cost over a threatened $100 billion in new tariffs. And what happened to the expanded effort to expand oil and gas exploration in the U.S.? This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. President Trump's top economic expert says the message from the threat of another $100 billion in tariffs on Chinese goods is enough is enough. Washington and Beijing continue to play their game of high stakes economic chicken tonight with China warning it will do whatever it has to to fight back. That situation along with a lower than expected number of jobs created in March led to another big market sell off today. The Dow sank 760 points before ending the day off 572. The S&P 500 dropped 58. The Nasdaq lost 161. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts starts us off tonight from the North Lawn. Good evening, John. Brett, good evening to you. Tariffs against Chinese and U.S. goods are still months away from being implemented, if at all. So the wild gyrations that we're seeing on Wall Street are driven by speculation about what might happen. The problem is no one knows what will happen, but clearly the stakes are growing higher. The proclamation from President Trump that he's thinking about tariffs on another hundred billion dollars in Chinese goods took the world by surprise, including his new chief economic advisor. When did the president first tell you that he was going to announce these additional potential hundred billion dollars in tariffs? Last evening. The threat was in response to China targeting $50 billion in U.S. goods for possible tariffs, an escalating game of brinksmanship that President Trump insists won't tip into an all-out trade war. We've already lost the trade war. We don't have a trade war. We've lost the trade war because for many years, uh, whether it's Clinton or the Bushes or Obama, uh, all of our presidents before have for some reason, they just, it just got worse and worse. The White House has been carefully downplaying the notion of a looming trade war. But Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin sent the stock market into a nosedive this afternoon when he said on business channel CNBC that a trade war is a possibility. China has not yet announced more retaliatory tariffs in response to the latest threat, but a spokesman for the Commerce Ministry sent this warning. We do not want to fight, but we are not afraid to fight a trade war. China will fight back for sure. China will respond in a new and comprehensive way. President Trump insists that China needs the U.S. more than the U.S. needs China. China depends on a robust export market to sustain its spectacular economic performance. China's debt has also soared to more than 300 percent of GDP because of a lending binge to fuel growth. China is trying to vacuum up as much technology as possible to transform its economy. Anything to slow the pace of Chinese exports could have a profound effect on China's long-term plans. The White House is enlisting help to put the economic squeeze on Beijing. Just give us another 24, 48 hours. You're going to see what I call a trade coalition of the willing to change and get China back into the world by abiding by the laws. President Trump acknowledged until that happens, there could be a rocky road ahead for the stock market. I'm not saying there won't be a little pain, but the market's gone up 
40 percent, 42 percent. So we may take a hit. And you know what? Ultimately, we're going to be much stronger for it. But it's something we had to do. President Trump heaped some pain on Russia today. The White House announcing sanctions against seven Russian oligarchs, 12 companies they own, as well as 17 senior Russian government officials, a state-owned weapons trading company, a bank it owns. The White House saying it's taking action against Russia's malign activities. This is in response to the CATSA law that was signed, that Congress passed and was signed by the president. Uh, the administration is holding Russia accountable. The actions brought a stern response from the Russian embassy in Washington in a statement saying Washington has delivered yet another blow on the Russian-U.S. relations. Now the sanctions cover captains of Russian business who refuse to play to Washington's scenario. But a White House that has suddenly taken a much sharper approach to Russia than it did for the past 15 months said the ball is in Russia's court. We would like to see is the totality of the Russian behavior change. Uh, we want to continue having conversations and work forward uh, to building a better relationship. On China and trade, the chief economic advisor Larry Kudlow told Fox News that the central issue here is technology and preventing China from stealing America's technological futures. He also said that the White House may, underscore may, provide the Chinese with a list of suggestions they'd like to see come out of negotiations in order to avoid the tariff war. Brett? John Roberts live on the North Lawn. John, thank you. Earlier today at the White House, a goodbye for the National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, leaving, and officials there at the White House giving him what's called a clap out. Everyone out there as he left his last day at the White House. Uh, no clue yet what H.R. McMaster will do next, uh, but he's going to step aside out of government work. John Bolton is scheduled to be the next national security advisor in that position. Let's look, look at what happened on another rocky ride for Wall Street today. Deirdre Bolton of Fox Business Network joins us from New York with some, wow, this is unbelievable, the ups and downs. Good evening, Deirdre. Uh, hi, Brett. At its worst, the Dow was down by more than 700 points, so it closed off the lows, still in the red, by 550 points. All three indices lower by at least 2% for the day, all lower for the week. So a noxious cocktail of three key ingredients hurt sentiment. First, traders are pricing in a potential trade war between the U.S. and China. Industrial stocks such as Caterpillar, Boeing, Deer, among the hardest hit, all down by more than 3%. There is time for China and the U.S. to sit down together to negotiate before a May deadline, but investors are pricing in the worst which is an all-out trade war between the world's two biggest economies. The mixed March jobs report also hurt sentiment. Fewer jobs were added to the U.S. economy than forecast. Investors ignored the bright spot of the 17-year low employment at 4.1 percent. Third point. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell took questions at the Economic Club of Chicago and said gradual rate hikes will help the Fed meet its inflation target. Traders heard this translation. Rates are going higher, and whenever I borrow money, I'm going to have to pay more to do it. Coming back full circle, Chairman Powell did not talk about trade tensions, but he said that tariffs affect the economy. Since consumers and businesses are the ones forced to pay more for imported goods, if tariffs are imposed, costs go higher. So in response, the Fed may have to raise rates even more to keep inflationary pressures in line, making all borrowing more expensive. So today was a recipe for selling, which is exactly what we got. Brett, back to you. Deirdre, thank you. Fears over tariffs China may impose on American goods is racing through the American heartland tonight. One of the industries bracing for the worst, pork. Fox Business Network correspondent Jeff Flock has that story tonight from Farmer City, Illinois. The biggest casualty in what the administration says is not a trade war. American hog farmers, like Rick Dean. Retaliatory Chinese tariffs on U.S. pork of 25 percent, jeopardizing business with America's second biggest export market. So if you lose that, it's going to be pretty hard on things. It's, uh, it, it'll, it'll erase your profitability. If we lose that, I'm really concerned that we'll, uh, we won't be profitable. We'll be operating in the red. Not to worry, says the administration. He will have the backs of American farmers when China tries to attack them. National Trade Council Director Peter Navarro telling Fox the president has a plan to shield farmers. We want to assure you that that plan will be put in place immediately. 
No word on what the plan is. Any attempt to compensate farmers could cost money and lead to further retaliation. And for an administration concerned about the trade deficit with China. We talk about trade deficits, but pork and soybeans, those trade are surplus. That's, those are trade surpluses and they're big, you know. Uh, they create value for, for all Americans. Already, China's tariffs on pork have driven down prices on the Chicago commodity markets to the point where it could cost more to raise a hog than it's worth. Rick Dean's son, Derek, is a fourth generation hog farmer. Do you think there's a future in this? Oh, there's definitely a future. Uh, my grandfather's been doing it, his dad's been doing it, and uh, we've always found a way to make it by somehow. The president tweeted today that despite his tariffs on aluminum and steel, lots of money is pouring into U.S. coffers and, quote, jobs, jobs, jobs. But the U.S. pork industry says it is responsible for more than half a million jobs. And taking them away in one place and potentially adding them in another really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them. Brett. Jeff Flock in Farmer City. Jeff, thanks. This is a Fox News alert. We have just learned some Texas National Guard troops are right now preparing to deploy to the southern border as part of President Trump's plan to secure the boundary with Mexico. Also in the past few minutes, Arizona's governor, Doug Ducey, says 150 of his state's National Guard members will be sent to the border next week. Now to a story we actually plan to bring you. The Defense Department is gearing up a new unit to help deal with security along that border. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin has the latest from the Pentagon tonight. President Trump wants up to 4,000 National Guard troops sent to the Mexico border as soon as possible. But so far, the Pentagon can't offer a timeline as to when those troops will deploy. That depends on the speed of state governors and DHS. We're looking at how we can best provide the support uh, to the Department of Homeland Security. And we'll figure it out. It'll be law and the spirit of Congress, no problem. The Pentagon announced it is standing up a new planning cell manned 24 7. Effective immediately, we are establishing a new border security support cell. This is not business as usual. That cell met for the first time today. The president says U.S. troops will build part of the wall on military borderlands. We're going to have our wall, and we're going to get it very strongly. He was referring to the Barry Goldwater live fire range in southwest Arizona, which runs just 31 miles of the roughly 2,000-mile border and sees jets dropping bombs daily. Border Patrol officials expect the military to be used in support roles. They'll be helping us in sort of the backroom activities. We've used them for, uh, previously to help repair roads and vehicles. We've used them to do intelligence and analysis for intelligence. When President Bush sent 6,000 guard to the border, it cost $415 million. One Democratic governor made it clear her forces would not be deploying. There's been absolutely no planning. There's been absolutely no uh, collaboration with the states. This is just something the president reeled off to distract from the problems that he's having in Washington, D.C. Officials tell me it could be two months before all the troops are in place. That's how long it takes to get the bureaucracy moving. Brett? Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Now to a different and even more troubled border. At least eight Palestinians are dead tonight and a thousand injured after another Friday demonstration against Israel's decade-long blockade along the Gaza boundary. Correspondent Connor Powell shows us from the border. Black plumes of smoke darken the skies over Gaza as tens of thousands of Palestinians massed along the Israeli security fence. Violence and a battle over narratives erupting once again. Palestinians called for an end to the Israeli blockade of Gaza and for the right to return to family lands, which they were forced from 70 years ago when the state of Israel was created. Israel warned that anyone, even unarmed protesters who approach the fence, risk getting shot. Even though this policy has drawn sharp international criticism, Israeli snipers killed at least eight people and wounded more than a thousand today. Palestinians tried a new tactic, burning hundreds of tires to obstruct the view of Israeli soldiers. These tires that you are seeing are not for war. We brought them to protect ourselves from the Israeli snipers. 
you can see the heavy black smoke pouring right across the border going into the Israeli military checkpoint area. The military responding with large fans to try to blow that smoke away and also with fire trucks to try to put out those fires. Israeli officials say these are not protesters, but instead terrorists using the cover of demonstrations to attack Israel. The Israeli military releasing video of one person trying to cut the border fence. Hamas government is encouraging its people to attack Israel, is encouraging its people to commit acts of violence. President Trump has not spoken publicly about the protests, but White House officials have called on Palestinians to protest peacefully and to stay several hundred feet away from the border, while those at the State Department have called on both sides to take the necessary steps to lower tensions. Brett. Connor Powell in Jerusalem. Connor, thank you. Former Russian spy Sergei Skripal is no longer in critical condition following his poisoning last month in England. A British health official says the 66 year old is improving rapidly. Skripal's 33 year old daughter regained consciousness last week and is now listed in stable condition. Again today, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov urged Britain to produce evidence it says implicates the Kremlin in that attack. Up next, we will take you to a place where there are more jobs than workers to fill them. There is one American community where the economy could not get much better. In fact, there are many more jobs available in Elkhart, Indiana, than there are workers to fill them. Correspondent Matt Finn looks at a problem many towns would love to have. Elkhart, Indiana, the RV manufacturing capital of the world, is a working class town that has weathered economic upticks and downturns and now is firing on all cylinders again. In the city of about 54,000, there are currently 9,000 job openings, including 30 positions at this package distribution center. In order to bring folks back home, we have to, we have to invest in ourselves. A team of private and public leaders is trying to maximize $300 million in donations and tax dollars to attract qualified workers to Elkhart County. The two main projects, a state-of-the-art $70 million fitness center and a downtown riverwalk with trails, housing and shops. The message now is a community message of uh, this is what Elkhart and Elkhart County has to offer um, if you move to this area. In March of 2009, Elkhart's jobless rate hit 20 percent, one of the worst in the country. President Obama visited the area four times, promising a portion of his stimulus package would bolster the economy. Today, Elkhart's unemployment rebounded to around 2 percent, half the national average. The challenge now, not just attracting workers, but convincing them the region's economy is stable. Workers are really concerned that maybe that job isn't as safe if we were to experience maybe another recession. The most recent stats from the Labor Department indicate the 12 state Midwest region is the only area of the country where job openings outnumber job seekers. Other towns in states like Iowa and Wisconsin are also trying to lure workers, just like Elkhart. If all things were equal, um, businesses and individuals can go almost anywhere. A newly constructed river walk is a nice amenity, but most important, workers want competitive wages. Stats from the U.S. Labor Department indicate the average weekly pay is on the rise here in Elkhart. Brett. Matt Fenn in the snowy Elkhart, Indiana. Matt, thanks. A federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit challenging Massachusetts' ban on assault weapons and large capacity magazines. The judge says the weapons fall beyond the reach of the Second Amendment. He says assault weapons or assault like weapons are military firearms and not protected by the constitutional right to bear arms. The plaintiffs in the suit have not commented so far. Breaking news from Texas tonight, Republican Congressman Blake Farenthold has abruptly resigned amid sexual misconduct allegations. Farenthold announced in December he would not seek re-election to a fifth term, apologizing for angry outbursts, but denying allegations of sexual harassment. Today, he says it is time for him to move along and look for new waves, ways to serve. A former aide has said Farenthold subjected her to sexually suggest suggestive comments and behavior and then fired her after she complained. 
Tonight we continue our look at some of the big midterm races by focusing on the Ohio governor's contest. Incumbent Republican John Kasich is term limited. Democrats and the GOP are fighting among themselves for a shot at gaining control of the state. From Columbus tonight, correspondent Peter Ducey looks at two competitive primaries. These days, the Democratic Party's kingmakers are getting a run for their money in Ohio. The uh, Democratic Party had an insider pick, uh, but the people of Ohio want fresh thinking. Dennis Kucinich is calling out his opponent in the Ohio primary for governor, Richard Cordray. I think we do have political differences, but I think a big difference is experience. Cordray is a favorite of progressives in D.C. from his days as the first ever head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We stood on the side of people and saw they were treated fairly in the marketplace. The Buckeye State backed Trump by eight points two years ago. Now Kucinich, the former congressman, Cleveland mayor, and Fox News contributor, is trying to show voters that Republicans aren't the only ones with solutions for jobs and trade issues. The power of... I have the ability to reach out to Trump supporters. We want to bring them back into the Democratic Party. A pair of Republicans are trying to keep that Trump coalition intact. Lieutenant Governor Mary Taylor and the Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine. Both are focusing heavily on the opioid epidemic and the economy. And both serve in the Kasich administration. But don't expect to hear much about that. I don't think. The governor is really a, a big factor in, in this race at all. Even Taylor, who was on the Kasich ticket, wants distance. We started with conservative solutions. I want to be very clear about this. John Kasich walked away from that conservative governance and those conservative principles. Taylor can't keep her staff. Taylor is being attacked for what her opponent sees as a lack of experience. If you go back and look at what she has done throughout her career, it's virtually nothing. But her campaign is turning that attack around. I bring 16 years of private sector experience. Mike DeWine has no relevant private sector experience. So Republicans are fighting about resumes as Democrats fight over a message in the midterms. My campaign is, is about shaking up that Democratic Party to make it respond to, to the people instead of just the interest groups. I asked Kucinich if it was tough taking on the Democratic establishment, and he laughed to say he's been doing it his entire life. Now the 71-year-old Kucinich sees an opening in a Democratic Party that's still trying to figure out how to win and who its national leaders are ahead of November. Brett? Peter Ducey live in Columbus. Peter, thank you. Up next, Dana Perino goes one-on-one -on -one with the number two executive at Facebook. First, Beyond Our Borders tonight. The fatal stabbing of an 18-year-old marks the 53rd murder in London so far this year. Officials blame the spike in deadly violence on gangs and drugs. In February and March, London hit the unwanted, unwanted milestone of recording more homicides than New York. Former South Korean President Park Geun-hye was formally convicted and sentenced to 24 years in prison today. It comes a year after the country's first female president was driven from office and arrested over a corruption scandal that saw months of massive street rallies calling for her ouster. Park has one week to appeal. Violence broke out in and around a rebel-held town near the Syrian capital of Damascus today, killing at least two people after nearly two weeks of calm there. It signals an apparent collapse of a truce and an evacuation deal for opposition fighters to leave that area. Syrian state TV says several airstrikes hit Doma after members of the Army of Islam rebel group shelled government-held areas nearby, inflicting casualties. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. The number two executive at Facebook says mistakes were made and there will be changes. The social media company is facing a privacy scandal that has sparked investigations in the U.S. and several other countries and sent Chief Operating Officer Sheryl Sandberg on a media apology tour. She spoke with Dana Perino this afternoon at Facebook headquarters. Dana joins us now live from Menlo Park, California. Good evening, Dana. How, uh, how does Sandberg plan to Thanks calm the fears? <laughs> Well, thanks for having me on the show, Brett. Um, they certainly have recognized one thing, which is the first step to recovery is admitting that you have a problem. They did that in spades over the week, saying that they recognize they have a problem, they have personal responsibility, and that they're going to try to do something about it. But the scope and scale of the problems that Facebook has right now is almost unimaginable. And I asked her about how big the company's gotten. Is Facebook getting just 
too big. I mean, it's part of the success of the business. It's gotten so big. You have two billion users. Can you hire enough people to actually keep up with that? At our size and scope, we have real responsibility. And we know that people have that question, and it's a question we're answering. We are ramping as quickly as possible. So, that, Brett, what they're trying to do is to say that they've gone from 10,000 people that, and they're hiring another 10,000. So that's good. There's jobs. But imagine now you have 20,000 people trying to deal with 2 billion users. It still feels like a problem that is just a little bit out of their control. And certainly they're going to be asked about that next week when Mark Zuckerberg testifies in front of Congress. Now, that'll be a big moment. What is the strategy for Facebook going into those hearings next week? Well, one of the things they've done this week is to try to soften up the ground. They've had several policy announcements of showing that they are taking some action. For example, today, right before the show uh, at 2 o'clock, they announced that they are going to deal something, do something about the political ads to make sure that you know where those ads are coming from, who is funding them, and if there's any problems with it, you will be alerted, and the person that put up that ad will be alerted. So they're trying to show that they're getting ahead of the problem. But I also think that the, what they want to do next week is to show that Facebook is focusing on the future, but you and I know, Brett, that the members of Congress aren't necessarily going to let them do that. They're going to make them pay for the problems of the past before they can do that. It isn't part of the necessary step. But you could also see regulation coming out of this that will not only affect Facebook, but all of the tech companies out here in Silicon Valley. Well, it was an interesting interview, and you can see the rest of it online. Uh, Dana, as always, thank you. Thank you. In tonight's Whatever Happened To segment, the effort to expand exploration for oil and gas here in the U.S. Long gone are the days of long lines for gasoline and skyrocketing fuel prices. Now America appears to be on a path toward energy independence and the top spot among the world's oil producers. Tonight, correspondent Kristen Fisher tells us where we are and where we may be going. We need an American first energy plan. President Trump has been a friend of the fossil fuel industries ever since the early days of his campaign. On his fourth day in office, he signed an executive order paving the way for the Keystone XL pipeline. We'll see if we can get that pipeline built. And now, over a year into the job, a new study shows the U.S. is on track to be the world's largest oil producer by 2023, thanks to the booming U.S. oil shale industry, near record-setting crude production, the highest in almost 50 years, and cuts in supply from current leaders like Saudi Arabia and Russia. But it will also take at least that long before the Keystone XL pipeline is operational and any new offshore drilling leases are approved. The pipeline continues to be plagued by lawsuits from landowners and environmentalists. And while the company behind the pipeline says it intends to start construction next year, it also says that it hasn't made a final decision to build it. As for offshore drilling, in January, Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke announced a plan to open virtually all U.S. waters to offshore oil drilling in five years. The proposal was instantly met with widespread bipartisan opposition on both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts. And just five days later, after meeting with the governor of Florida, Secretary Zinke pulled the politically important state off the table, saying, quote, that Florida is unique and its coasts are heavily reliant on tourism as an economic driver. That prompted governors from California to Connecticut to say, hey, we're unique too. At a hearing on Capitol Hill last month, the secretary himself seemed to suggest that the entire West Coast could also receive an exemption. Uh, on the oil and gas, you should, you should know off the coast of Oregon, Washington, most of California, there are no known, re no, no, no known resources of any weight. Now, so far, the governors of only two states support the president's plan, Alaska and Maine. Every other governor of states on the east and west coast oppose it, Brett. Kristen, thank you. Up next, the panel on today's headlines. But first, former Senator Daniel Akaka of Hawaii has died. The Democrat was the first native Hawaiian elected to Congress. Akaka served in the Senate for more than two decades before retiring in 2013. A World War II veteran himself, Akaka successfully sponsored federal legislation that resulted in medals of honor for 22 Asian American soldiers who fought during World War II. 
Daniel Lakaka was 93. Willing to continue negotiations. On the other hand, the president is absolutely prepared to defend our interests. We've already lost a trade war. We don't have a trade war. We've lost a trade war. We do not want to fight, but we are not afraid to fight a trade war. China will fight back for sure. China will respond in a new and comprehensive way. We're focused on the long-term economic principles. Let's be clear, the tariffs that we're talking about with China have not been implemented in our months away. So we may take a hit, and you know what? Ultimately, we're going to be much stronger for it. Well, what is going to happen if these tariffs, the new ones, are put in place and China retaliates? Uh, the Dow, a little shaky on this question uh, today. It's assumed dealing with this. Uh, we, as you look at the fall off, about 760 got some back at the end of the trading day. Um, the president has been very open about this. He's been tweeting about it. We pay attention to a lot of his tweets. This is actually a retweet of his own tweet. So we do pay, pay a special attention. Attention to this one. We are not in a trade war with China. That war was lost many years ago by the foolish or incompetent people who represented the U.S. Now we have a trade deficit of 500 billion a year with intellectual property theft of another 300 billion. We cannot let this continue. Double tweeted that one. Let's bring in our panel. Jonah Goldberg, senior editor at the National Review. Charles Lane, opinion writer for the Washington Post. And Charles Hurt, opinion editor for the Washington Times. Charlie, uh, thoughts where this is headed and if it's a collision course we're looking at? Yeah, well, it's certainly uh, not something we've seen around Washington for a very long time. But, uh, but the, the president is right about this. If you look back at the past uh, 20, 30 years, uh, we have been at sort of war with China uh, over uh, at an economic war, whether it's uh, textiles or furniture. Uh, they uh, th th they uh, steal, uh, you know, our, our uh, intellectual property as well as our designs and things like that. Um, they've been eating our lunch for a very long time, and it's something politicians in both parties have uh, uh, paid lip service to and campaigned on trying to do something about. And this is a guy who, and we can all debate about whether this is the right way to do it, or and we don't know whether he will succeed. But at the end of the day, uh, this is something that uh, that he pro he won an election promising to do something about and obviously no politician would ever uh, embark on a fight like this a few months before a midterm election but this guy is not a regular politician. Larry Kudlow in his new job has been talking about tariffs. Stick with us. Tariff hikes are prosperity killers. They always have been and they always will be. If you lower tariffs and lower barriers and open markets and clearly follow the laws with respect to technology uh, stealing, this will be good for everybody. My point is, tariffs enter the picture, negotiations enter the picture, the WTO enters the picture. You follow? And you've just got to walk through this process and we'll see. Hopefully, this will have a very happy ending. You follow? This is a negotiation, he says. Chuck, uh, and he'll be on Fox News Sunday this weekend. He's been on in several shows, uh, kind of laying this out, saying it's not a done deal yet. This is part of the negotiation. Well, it, what you uh, heard Larry Kudlow saying there in a vague way was more or less the line of American industry itself, particularly the high-tech industries, who are very annoyed with China. They are getting hurt by China, but they fear a total blow up. And they, what they're asking of the Trump administration is to treat the end game here as one in which the goal is to bring China back into WTO compliance, not what the president says, which is to get China to decrease its bilateral deficit with the United States. So in a way, Larry Kudlow there is articulating the view of mainstream American business, but I'm not sure that is the view of the president. I think the president is fixated on the bilateral trade deficit. I think he feels that in a way we have the upper hand because since we import so more, we can put more tariffs on more stuff. And it, 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 there is a negotiation going on. It's not like, will there be one? And the question is going to be, will the president accept what China seems to be prepared to offer, which is a lower tariff on our cars and maybe some of their semiconductor market in return for calling off these tariffs, or does he want something more? Jonah, the signals from China, and, and you talk to people who know China well, uh, suggest that they just want to know what Trump wants from them. I mean, he, they are so confused, it seems, yeah. that it's almost they're, they're off their game. 
No, I, I think that's right, and I'm not sure it's necessarily an advantage. I think a lot of things need to be separated out. The intellectual property theft is a real problem, and that needs to be done about it. And American businesses need to be scolded for their cl complicity in this. They complain about it, but they go along with it when they go over to China because they want to be part of those markets. Um, but this announcing of these tariffs, now it's, it's kind of like that scene in The Usual Suspects where Kaiser Sosa kills his own family before he even tries to negotiate. Because we could have gone into the WTO a year and a half ago at the beginning of this and filed complaints against China that were really aggressive on a multilateral lines. And the, 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 the fact is we're not all that compliant with WTO either. But China actually has a much deeper interest in staying in good graces of WTO, and they tend to actually comply with that stuff. Instead, we've gone straight to threatening the trade war part without actually working on this. And when I listen to poor Larry, I love Larry Kudlow. I've known Larry Kudlow for 25 years. Um, he's in this position of trying to make this a rational thing about negotiations, about um, intellectual property theft. But Donald Trump has, for 30 years, said that he cares about the bilateral trade stuff. He, it used to be Japan, and now it's China, and he just has a different economic view of this stuff. All right, but let's put the Kaiser Sosa, uh, Sosa <laughs> away. But if shaking up the pot, like he did on North Korea, changes the dynamic, is that a bad thing? It could be a great thing, or it could be a terrible thing. It could be a terrible <laughs> thing, exactly. All right, let me turn to Russia. Uh, listen to the White House press secretary. The administration has sanctioned seven Russian oligarchs, 12 companies, and 17 top government officials and allies of Russian President Vladimir Putin. What we all want at the end is good relationships with Russia when it comes to being able to have a stabilized uh, re region. But that, of course, would include that Russia does not move forward with bad behavior. We're going to continue working forward in uh, what we can to have that meeting and have a meeting with Vladimir Putin at some point. Uh, Russian embassy putting out a statement in reaction to these new sanctions. Washington has delivered yet another blow on the Russian-U.S. relations. Now the sanctions cover captains of Russian business who refuse to play to Washington's scenario. The United States has made yet another erroneous step to destroy the freedom of enterprise and competition to impair in integration processes in the global economy. Um, this is kind of a wordy statement from the Russian embassy, but uh, bottom line, for all the talk, uh, this administration is, is pretty tough on Russia now. Yeah, and, and it's kind of unfortunate uh, that it's taken this long. Uh, but I think that, that a big reason for that is that, that so early on, this whole issue about Russia meddling in the election became so hotly politicized. And it, and it uh, turned into a partisan thing uh, where it, it really probably shouldn't have been nearly as partisan as, as it is. And quite frankly, I, you know, I, I think the lion's share of the blame for that uh, lies at people who have tried to, who have turned this Russia thing into, uh, um, you know, where, where they're, any way that they can smear Donald Trump. They go Quickly. Well, what strikes me about this is the sweeping nature, the tough nature of, of the condemnation of Russian behavior. They're not specifying that it's because of the poisoning in London or anything like that. It's Russia is generally creating mischief in the world. And that is a big statement. That is a big new orientation in uh, foreign policy. Next up, Friday Lightning Round, the economy, immigration, winners and losers. I believe that if you take into account the Trump tax cut, mm -hmm. you take into account the drop in unemployment, and particularly unemployment for African Americans, it's the lowest it's ever been in history. When you put all of that together, uh, I believe that the economy is on a strong growth path. Bob Johnson, founder of BET, uh, talking about the economy. This, as you had the March jobs report, it did uh, disappoint today. 103,000 jobs uh, added, down from 326,000 in February. 4.1% is the unemployment rate. If you look at the economic changes, however, since January 2017, you see the changes, real GDP growth, 2.9% in comparison to January 2017. And that consumer confidence number is a big one uh, as people are thinking about how they feel about the economy. Back with the lightning round, uh, Jonah. Um, I, I don't think they're that disappointing. And I, you know, when I listen to Bob Johnson there, what strikes me is that should be the Republican message right now going into the midterms and maybe not some of the other stuff that we've been hearing, but such as it is.
Chuck? There's no question the economy is doing great. Lots of credit goes to the Federal Reserve, whose experimental policies to come back from the recession have turned out to work quite well. What will be very interesting to see is whether it is really true that Americans vote their pocketbooks mm -hmm. in 2018 or whether they have their minds on a whole bunch of other issues. Take a look at the stock market since the election of Donald Trump. Uh, a lot of negative numbers in recent days. However, look at since the election uh, where this market is and has been. Uh, you know, if you believe that slashing red tape in, inside the federal government I I regulations uh, is good for the economy, and, and then you look at all of the indicators, it, I would agree that the economy is very good. But, you know, it is a real question, <laughs> uh, you know, when you have it, the, the atmosphere is this volatile um, in the months before an election. I'm, I know that there are a lot of Republicans who are uh, uh, kind of like a long-tailed cat in a, chair, a room full of rocking chairs. It's kind of nerve-wracking for them. There you go. Immigration. Uh, the president and the president of Mexico. The border is very important yes. now. That's a big, big subject. And, you know, we're stopping them. Uh, we called out the military. We're calling out the military. And it's, it's a very, very powerful subject. If your recent statements are the result of frustration due to domestic policy issues to your laws or to your Congress, it is to them that you should turn to, not to Mexicans. Okay. Uh, Chuck, there's... Governors along the, the border states, three of them so far, have come forward with hundreds of National Guard troops, but not two to 4,000 as of yet. It's a crisis atmosphere, but missing the crisis, because actually the numbers of people being apprehended at the border are at about a 40-year low. And so I see this as election year politics. Immigration, uh, control of the border is a huge issue for President Trump and his base, and sending the National Guard down there dramatizes it. Yeah, I think this is mostly political theater, um, and it, it's, I don't think it's entirely a coincidence that it came with a sort of a revolt from the sort of Ann Coulter right about the immigration issue for Donald Trump. Uh, it, it may work with him for the base. I don't think it's going to be all that helpful for the Republicans in the midterms. Winners and losers. Uh, winner, uh, winner Jeff Sessions for uh, on the border, uh, crack, cracking down on t telling his prosecutors to start prosecuting border crossers. Uh, loser uh, of the week is uh, all those people who are expecting a uh, imminent Mueller indictment of Donald Trump's announcement uh, or, or the report uh, that uh, he had told he's told Donald Trump that he's not uh, the target of this investigation. My winner of the week, you've already done a whole segment on them, Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, the front page of the Wall Street Journal today also had the story of their remarkable rebound from the economic recession. And, you know, I think everybody in America ought to be happy that there are abundant jobs in the heartland. That's good for everyone. My loser has to be Scott Pruitt, who fumbled his interview on this network and made his ethics predicament that much worse. There's a lot of rumors around town that his job is in danger. The question is whether President Trump thinks his job is in danger. Yes. Uh, Jonah. Uh, my winner of the week is The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, because really? uh, I think he has handled uh, uh, the draft Johnson for president movement the right way, which is to say he doesn't know enough to do it quite yet, maybe someday in the future, but not 2020. And uh, my loser of the week, which kind of pains me, is The Atlantic Magazine, which fired my former and maybe soon to be again colleague Kevin Williamson, essentially for thought crimes because a Twitter mob demanded it be so. That was quite something. You know, Jumanji 2, you don't think it's going to put him back in the game? <laughs> hey, Jumanji was pretty good. That was pretty good, actually. <laughs> Panel, thank you. When we come back, notable quotables.